Hey guys, thanks for coming out. Um, I'm Rebecca. I'm the director of digital at Indiegogo, which means that my job is to work with awesome YouTube creators like these guys up here on their campaigns. Um, Indiegogo has had the honor of getting to work with a bunch of YouTube creators just like you guys over the past couple of years, raising about $18 million for their projects. Uh, some of my, yeah, some of my awesome coworkers are here. Uh, they're in the back. Raise your hands, guys. If you guys have any questions, they are ready to help answer them. Um, so I just want to start off by, let's uh, go down the line and uh, you guys say a little bit about who you are, what your channels are. Uh, my name is Carlo Moss. I'm one of the creators, along with this guy, of The Most Popular Girls in School, which is a stop motion animated series on YouTube. And we used Indiegogo for our last season to shoot an entire season here at the YouTube space. <laughs> Follow that, buddy. <laughs> I'm Mark Copa. I'm his partner. And I do all the stuff he does as well. I'm Melissa Hunter, and I um, created the show Adult Wednesday Adams, and I write and act in that as well. <laughs> so, I just, so, I just yeah. watched that. <laughs> uh, I am Tom Gray. I am the co-creator of Player Piano, which is a um, music series on YouTube where my partner in it is a ridiculously talented composer and pianist. Um, she writes arrangements of film, TV, and video game scores, and I make videos. I'm Brittany Sandler, and I work with Jimmy Wong, who can say a lot more about everything he does online. Oh, yeah. Hi, I'm Jimmy Wong. Uh, we fundraise on Indiegogo for my next project, which is uh, currently in the writing phase right now. It's a musical comedy web series tentatively titled Band-Aid. Uh, and I was also an actor on a show called Video Game High School, which fundraised on Indiegogo for the third and final season as well. Cool, thanks guys. Um, yeah, these guys are all awesome. If you have not seen their content before, definitely check it out because they're all amazing creators. Um, so uh, Carlo and Mark, since you guys are closest to me, you guys, yeah, uh, started off, let us know, um, what's the biggest obstacle you faced creating the content before your campaign? Like, was it you know time, money, marketing, just getting it out there? I mean, certainly, number one would be you taught yourself stop motion. Right. So that was a big thing. Yeah, our show is a stop motion show, so we go very slow. Like, we shoot, like, a, a minute of footage after several hours, and it's one shot at a time. So to, to do the content for our Indiegogo campaign, whether it was just the uh, videos to advertise Indiegogo or the actual videos we produced after we raised the money, it, that was definitely a major time-consuming process. And also, uh, our first season we shot, uh, that, that's the only season that we've done that we didn't crowdfund, and just the time that it took to do it we, we would release a new video every three weeks, which on YouTube, like, just doesn't work. Um, and so crowdfunding was what allowed us to actually create a regular schedule, start releasing weekly videos, and eventually multiple videos every week. Right, because you could fund, and you could go into production, and then you could start to release them, and your audience was already there and ready. Exactly. And, yeah. you know, a after, crowd after our crowdfunding, uh, the, f the first campaign we did, it allowed Mark to come on full-time, our next campaign that we did allowed me to come on full time and then it, we were able to make it into an actual job and something that we could put our everything into. Uh, Melissa, what about you uh, doing Adult Wednesday Adams? What was kind of the biggest obstacle you faced before the crowdfunding campaign with Indiegogo? Um, with Indiegogo or with? Well, before, like well, before you yeah. did the campaign. Yeah, so I made the first season, I crowdfunded the second season of Adult Wednesday Adams and the first season I made entirely on my own with savings <laughs> from my own bank account and every favor I've ever had in my entire life. Um, so that was definitely a challenge, but I think what it did was it allowed me to get, to build a fan base and give a proof of concept. So I had the first season and I think that's why the fan base came roaring back for season two, because everyone was so excited about it that they were so excited to give a few bucks to see it again. And Tom, what about you? I know that you guys started off as a cosplayer piano on Stanley's World of Heroes and had to kind of 
Yeah. Relaunch. So, so the the series actually started. I used to run Stanley's YouTube channel, and uh, we did four episodes of the show called Cosplay Piano, and we really had a good time doing it. And when the channel ultimately folded. Uh, we wanted to do something uh, with Cosplay Piano. And, you know, um, Stanley's channel wasn't there anymore, so we didn't have any funding for that. Um, I pitched it all over town. In fact, I pitched to Jimmy, who liked it and just didn't want it. <laughs> it didn't get a go. I, I was like, here, guys. And then it was like, ah. But I pitched it everywhere, and everybody said no, 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 no. Um, and ultimately, I was like, okay, well, we'll just we'll rebrand it, and we'll start something new. Um, that was about a year and a half, two years after Cosplay Piano had posted its last video. So we didn't actually have any fan base. We didn't have anything we couldn't post on World of Heroes um, to let people know that we were starting something new. So I was actually terrified going into the Indiegogo campaign because we had no fan base. And we actually launched the channel basically on the Indiegogo campaign. We, I, I found a couple friends who were ridiculously generous and somehow allowed me to convince them that they should let me borrow a whole lot of money uh, in order to produce some content. And the whole idea was that we would be releasing a new video every week during the course of the crowdfund campaign. Um, so when we started, we had no idea if it was going to work. I hoped that it would so I could you know, pay those people back and then fund future videos. Um, so we had, the, we had the issue of starting a brand new thing and then at the same time asking those people for money on top of their subscribers. So luckily it worked out. It worked out pretty well. It, yeah. it, it, I will, we learned a lot, and I'll get into that later. We learned a lot what not to do, what to do, and uh, I actually went to the hospital at one point with a panic attack, which was terrifying. <laughs> Don't borrow money from your friends if you're not entirely sure you're gonna pay them back. <laughs> And Jimmy, um, so you obviously are you know, probably best known for playing Ted Wong in Video Game High School, which, yeah, we're in the shirt. Funded uh, its third season with Indiegogo, raised about $900,000, which at the time was the highest grossing crowdfunded campaign for a web series. Yeah. Um, you had what, like 11,000 contributors to that campaign? Yep, yeah. and I did customer service for that, and that was <laughs> so much fun. Yeah, you would have, uh, luckily we have Amplifier now, which is our fulfillment partner for yeah. Perks, which makes that a lot easier for yeah. creators. Um, you can focus on doing your campaign and on the creative. But uh, so what was kind of like the transition like for you going from video game high school to funding Band-Aid, which was kind of a new project, very different direction? Yeah, so the pro so uh, how many of you guys know what video game high school is? So it's, oh cool. So it's very, you know, it's kind of like a fun mix of like fantasy video games and scrubs and a bunch of other shows. And it's just like this very sort of heart on its sleeve, fun show. Uh, and I, after finishing the series, because um, I started doing YouTube stuff like five years ago, and I started doing musical stuff originally, um, and I never got to go back to it. So I was really interested in sort of getting back to my roots. And this is a project that I wanted to do for several years. So there was a bit of a, I felt risk when I started the campaign because it was like, hey, you know me for this very specific character on this show, and a lot of you are really, um, I guess, you know, sad that it's not gonna have a fourth season, et cetera, and I'm starting my own campaign that's a musical comedy, which feels like as far as it can be from a show about in a high school that's for pro video gamers. So um, it was definitely a risk. I, I went, going into it, I felt, very nervous because I knew that I couldn't ask for a lot, even though I wanted to have a certain amount. I actually set my total to half the amount that I actually wanted just because I didn't want, I didn't, there was a lot of things about like, you don't want someone to look at it and be like, wow, this guy's just mooching off of prior, you know, people knowing him to get more money now. And there was so much other stuff going into these sort of tactics of setting what the goals were to be um, that I was definitely nervous, but it ended up working out really well, which is, Thank God. <laughs> and the timing for that was tricky, too, because when we launched it, it was like right when season three was kind of starting to wrap up. So there was a lot of, why isn't this going to video game high school season four? Yeah. Um, it's like, but you guys like musicals, right? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> but that's also to Jimmy's credit that he has a lot of other stuff. He has like his channel, Fees of Fiction. Yeah. He does music videos. So it's like it fed into once we could make the conversation more about Jimmy wanting to do something cool and new and exciting. Yeah. It just took a while to get that conversation going. 
Yeah, can you talk a little bit more about how you kind of message that to the fans of like, you know, because you have your existing audience on your own channel for your own mm -hmm. content, and then all of the new fans coming over from Video Game High School, how you kind of would message to them, like, look, this is, take this ride with me, basically. I think the big thing was just be super consistent in your messaging, and that you don't just post once, hey, I'm starting a crowdfunding campaign, but you post it, and Brittany was really helpful with this, because I'm just, sometimes I just get really lazy with Twitter and Instagram, and really it's like, you know, if you think about it, like, when Twitter first started and you first started following people, you follow like 10 people and you would see their tweets even if they were five days old because your timeline didn't have that much to go through. And as Twitter grew and grew and grew, you followed more people and people were tweeting more often, retweeting more often, and eventually you could be following 600 people and literally just based on when you check Twitter during the day, you could never ever see a tweet from a specific person ever again just based on timing alone. So it really helped to just be really consistent with the messaging about what we were doing, what the musical was about, that it is a musical, that it's a continuation of myself as an actor and creator. It's not a continuation of this other thing, although you may know it for me. So it's like really just shoving as much information about what you're doing as possible on a consistent basis, and hopefully people will slowly catch on, retweet the right things, and that network of information will spread enough so that people will understand what you're doing. Yeah, and the big part of it was really just getting Jimmy to be the forefront of the conversation um, because it is so much of his passion project and really making that appeal to the fans. Because even though he has a fan base, it's as Ted Wong from Video Game High School, even though he's been doing so much content. Ted Wong, who is also terrible at music, like he's just one of the worst. Like that's a, a, a ongoing thing through the show. So like coming out and be like, I'm doing a musical comedy. Like there couldn't be at more sort of polar opposite ends. Yeah. So that I think brings up an interesting point, which is you're very much in front of the camera and you're very much a presence in everything. But for Carlo, Mark, Tom, you guys are kind of more behind the camera. How did you promote the content and kind of put yourself in there and feel authentic about it when you were doing your Indiegogo campaigns? You know, for us, uh, we, we hit a point as our series started to grow where Mark and I and our other partner on the show, Lily, we all looked at each other and we were like, oh, people are watching these videos and they have no idea who we are. We should start making small efforts to, whether it's uh, at, at the post roll of videos, talk to the audience, get them to know our personalities. And, you know, it, and, and it's kind of like a hard thing because it's, it's like getting over your ego, right? And, the, and that hard thing of, well, I don't wanna like put myself out there and be that person. And, but we, we kind of made that effort of like, okay, let's let our audience actually get to know us. Yeah, it was really important because, you know, the, we were well, well aware that the, obviously the show was about all of our characters and the storylines and it had nothing to do with us. But at the same time, it was really important and we realized more and more how important it was that the audience like us and know us and want to talk to us and hear from us because it's a lot easier for us to communicate messages than to be like, all right, we're about to do a five minute stop motion video where some doll is gonna be like, here's the new campaign, here's what's gonna happen. You know, so it was good, it, it, it gives us a lot more power if two, two people can just talk about things and really relate to people as opposed to keeping everything in the world of the show. So we had to kind of break out and at the end of the video show up and have little bits and fun times so the fans could like us just as much as they like all of our characters. And also go through the growing pains of being super awkward on camera and staring directly <laughs> into the camera. And yeah. Looking. I was if you, terrified. If you watch our early right? videos, he is awful on camera. So bad. It's he would just so stare sad. at the camera like this when he wasn't talking. I mean, it was that's, amazing. That's not the important part. So. The important yeah, part I, is I am still out. absolutely terrified of the camera. In fact, that we shot something earlier today, and uh, both Sony and I were just like, we are never going to get used to actually talking to the camera. Um, when we, one of the things that happened when we started our own channel, because when we were doing the the four chan the four episodes that we did on uh, World of Heroes, we didn't have any control over what happened after, like on the end cards or anything like that. We couldn't say what links we wanted. We couldn't really, uh, we tried to do a little bit where Sonia would talk and at the end of the video and say something, but it didn't really work out too well. So um, what we wanted to do when we started our own channel was make sure that we presented ourselves not just as Sonia because she's in all the videos, she's playing the piano, um, but to sort of present ourselves as like a team because you know I make the videos, she writes the music and performs the music 
And um, that sort of partnership is what Player Piano is and what it's all about. So we wanted to make sure that came across. So what we started to do, um, because we're not good at talking to the camera, uh, we started to do like the, the kind of Bob Dylan cue card thing. Uh, but we did it kind of in a fun way where we'd hit each other and do a lot of falls and gags like that. Um, and people really started to, to like that. And I think ultimately that's sort of the key to, people like to follow great content, but they more than that, they kind of want to follow people. Um, so if you have both great content and people, you're, you've, you've got a, a recipe for success. Um, but so we started doing the card thing, that worked out really well, and then ultimately we, started doing some things where we'd talk, and that's sort of what began to change it for us on our Indiegogo campaign. Melissa, I feel like that's something that worked really well for you, because you're playing Adult Wednesday Adams, which is this character that everybody knows, yeah. but like even in your campaign video, you go back and forth from being her and being you. So yeah. how did you kind of make that you know, kind of sell? Yeah, I was gonna kind of speak to that, because I think even though I am in front of the camera, a lot of people do, would not recognize me with this hair and this attitude, this shining, You're sunny smiling. attitude. <laughs> um, so yeah, I found that, I decided that that was really important for me, because people love Wednesday, but she also is a homicidal maniac, so I figured I should add a little flair into the video. So I, um, I thought it was really important for the fans to connect to me and know who I am, as a creator, and so what I did with the video was I basically like flipped between me just directly speaking to the camera about this campaign and why it's important to me, and really speaking from the heart, which I think people do really do respond to, and then having like a back and forth between me and Wednesday, like cutting to her, because that's, you know, that's the star in the, in the show. So I thought that really resonated with people. And how have you, um, kind of going off of that, been able to kind of interact with your audience since the Indiegogo campaign and kind of bring them in now that season two is, you know, kind of all up and they've, what, what kind of reaction are you getting from them and, you know, can you talk about that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, I mean, this season has been huge. It was, I went from like 50,000 subscribers to 250 and um, it, it was this one video, Cat Caller, uh, Wednesday, seeks vengeance on cat collars, and that kind of blew up. Um, but the great thing about a video that blows up when it's not, usually it's just a one-off video, right, that goes viral, and so if you've done the work and you kind of keep going and keep making episodes, if one hits down the line, you have a whole season, and I think that's why my, it wasn't just the views, it was the subscribers that built up, because they're, they see that there's this whole series connected to it. So I think that's a good testament to never like giving up, even if the videos don't like hit on the first one. You have to give it some time. Um, but I think in relation to that, with connecting to my fans, you know, I did it kind of two ways, which on my Twitter and Instagram and stuff like that, I talk as if I'm myself, but on YouTube, I often, when I have the time, I go in and respond as Wednesday, and I think people really get a kick out of that, and that helped user engagement a lot. Awesome. Uh, so Carla and Mark, kind of off of that, you guys, as you already said, have crowdfunded the three most recent seasons of Most Popular Girls in School, and every time, you know, you're reaching out to the same audience, which is growing along with you, but every time you've managed not only to raise the goal of your campaign, but to also beat it by like $6,000. How do you keep galvanizing your audience to come back again and again? You know, part of it is we look at that as an advantage because what our audience, our audience is now educated in how crowdfunding works. And, and we have a lot of fans who will tweet us when we're on our off season and be like, when does the Indiegogo campaign start? And they, they just assume that that's the signal that the season starts. So, so we have that as an advantage. And then like this season, you know, Mark and I were talking about, all right, we don't want to do just a, another boring, hey guys video where, where we're just sitting there and explaining the same thing we explained the last two years. And so we came up with this idea of why don't we have, for, for the four weeks of the campaign, have each of the characters start their own crowdfunding campaign? Because we knew that our audience knew the shorthand. We knew that if we said, hey, uh, if Brittany came on and said, I'm raising $15,000 for my revenge fund, they would go to Indiegogo, they would know, okay, well that's season four. 
Yeah, it's also like a preview of the story. Exactly. Right. And, and so what, what we ended up doing was we made four videos, and all of those videos also tied back into the story of the season as it would unfold. So, go ahead. Yeah, so it was just like, it was a, the joke was that each character is pretend is saying that this is their campaign, even though all links go back to this one campaign in season four, to the point of their campaign would have some crazy long name that if you take the, all the letters, it spells MPGIS season four. And they'd be like, oh, for short, MPGIS season four. Even though it was so one character wanted to have her own record album, one character wanted to get revenge. And so it lets you know what's going to happen in the season. And also, they get to watch the characters do what they love, which is, you know, talk and be funny and whatever. And, and as opposed to me and Carlo every week saying, we could use some more money. Hey, Guys, we still money, need money. Please, <laughs> please. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely is a thing also that the fans knew that we do this Indiegogo process. And they don't have a problem with it. They get that that's how it works. And so, yeah, we would get asked, when's the next campaign, way before we'd get asked, when's the next season? Because they know that they're ready. They're like, I'm ready to do something. And also, um, this season, you know, we knew it was going to be a little bit shorter than last season, so we actually asked for less than we did the season before, which is pretty unique. Even though we had way more subscribers, more viewers, we still asked for less money because we only needed less. And we wanted to be honest about that. We still ended up raising more money than we ever have before, because that's just how it worked. But I think it was definitely worked in our favor that our fans saw, oh, they're being very honest. We, we're not going to ask for a bunch more because we're bigger. We're going to ask for what we need. Yeah, we, one of our big things, not just with our crowdfunding, but with all aspects of our production, is transparency. And so we, you know, we explained to the audience when we launched this last Indiegogo campaign, here's the exact number that we need to go into the YouTube space, here's why we're doing it, because Mark's been hand animating everything for the last three years, pulling all-nighters, we wanna bring in actual animators, here's the amount of money that we need from you guys, here's the amount of money that we'll pay out of pocket, and you know, we, and, you know dress it up with, cool little graphics and bar graphs and, and show everything, but be 100% transparent. And that way people aren't going, well, what do you need all, the, all that money for to, to make Barbies talk about poop? <laughs> you know, that, that way we're, we're explaining and saying, this goes to this, this goes to this, this goes to this. I think that transparency that you're talking about is kind of, I don't know, for me it's one of the things that uh, sets Indiegogo apart a little bit is that it's an open platform, so any idea has a chance to get out there in front of people and find its audience. And I think a lot of that comes down to, you know, a, a really well-run campaign like all of you have done is really transparent about where the money goes, what it's going to go for. But also, I think it comes down a lot to the perks and what you're offering your audience in return, which is not just, you know, an opportunity to take part in your next project or the next season, but to actually, in a way, own a piece of it. Um, and you all had really amazing perks in your campaign. I mean, I know, like, for $5, Melissa, in your campaign, Wednesday would make a promise not to kill you. <laughs> which was pretty awesome. <laughs> um, and you guys had those really cool download packs. Uh, you know, I think if, if you guys could all talk a little bit about kind of what some of the favorite perks that you guys all offered in your campaigns were, um, either like on a personal level, what you liked the best, and then maybe also what your fans liked the best. I, mean, I, I think for us, one of our favorite things was uh, this last season, we offered foam middle fingers because our show is very vulgar and very over the top, so, and it takes place at a high school. So we offered foam middle fingers, um, and I mean, the, the, we offered set pieces, like in season three, we blow up one of the characters' cars, and so we said, okay, well we don't need that anymore. Let's put it out there, and, and if somebody wants it, awesome. And, and yeah, if you, have a, if you have a web series with a following and there's like pieces that are props or something that you could either, one, you could get rid of because it's not going to be in the show anymore, or if it's something that's kind of easy to replicate, uh, then you could, because for instance, we had a bathroom set that we've been using the same one for three years, and I was like, I need to remake this, it's falling apart, so we, uh, we put that as one of our high bids and we sold it almost immediately. And it was like a really nice thing because it was something we couldn't use anymore. It would have got thrown out. But to the fans, it was a big deal because it's the first set of the first episode. So those kinds of things are things that are very low cost to you but very valuable to a fan base if you have it. Well, it's smart too because if it's something that you're putting money into for your production that you can only use once, why not go on and continue to monetize that? Yeah. Melissa, what about you? Um, yeah, along with that, at a certain level, I did scare packages. So it was like care packages of the creepiest shit from the campaign from the shoot so it was like 
I have this one episode where there are a bunch of melted Barbies because she's babysitting a girl, and so we like took pieces of the melted Barbies and stuff like that. By the way, can uh, we can we use those? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Speaking of Barbies, um, the most popular one, and I when I was doing research on setting up the campaign, I was told that the twenty five dollar level is the most popular level. That is true. Okay, great. I'm glad I did my homework. Uh, so I decided to do one that I knew that people would really like that I could do myself, and that was. Um, Wednesday sits on your grave, and that was, I have this picture when I was doing original portraits for the show that is me at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery sitting on this big grave, and so I edited the, I would edit the name and say like what they died of and what their last words were, <laughs> and it was like very, you know, it was like jumping out, like uh, headbutted by local goat, and then the last <laughs> words would be like, Betcha I can pull this dumb bo goat's beard, you know, just like funny deaths, <laughs> not really tragic ones. Um, but uh, the point is, all of the perks were, were within the voice of the show. And I think that's something that if you're a fan of the show or if you're a fan of the idea, people will want something that's a perk that's very related and grounded in that world. So right. I think you don't want to become a t-shirt factory just so you can make your show. You want to yeah. kind of make it so that it's more personal. Yeah, and think about what it is if people like your idea, what they would want. Yeah. Tom, what about you? Um, I, I was really surprised, actually, by how much we changed the perks throughout the campaign. Um, when we started, like I said, we, we sort of started at zero um, with just starting the channel and starting everything. So we had a new high-quality music video coming out every single week. Um, that's based off of popular songs, films, and TV, and video game scores. And um, we had a lot of really, I mean, it was a music thing, so we had digital downloads. Um, those are sort of what you would expect. We had some scores, um, sheet music, that kind of stuff. Um, and then one of our bigger things is we, for one of our videos, um, we built for Tetris and Street Fighter, actually two of our videos, we shot at a, an, an arcade. And um, we built a piano that looked like a arcade machine. Like it had a coin slot, it had custom graphics on the outside, we had pinball elements inside. It's a really ridiculously awesome piano. So one of our big things is like, oh, this piano is really cool. People are gonna see this video, they're going to love it. This thing is gonna blow up, it's gonna be great. This is before we launched, by the way, I was, that was my thing. Um, so we did this whole thing for the sweepstakes for this piano so that, you know, if you, anybody that donates at, at least, I forget, we had two pianos that we were giving away, one for our Akira video and one for our Tetris video. Um, and we were like, everybody that donates $10, I think, or $15, in addition to all the other perks, you get you know, entered into the sweepstakes. Anybody that you know, contributes a certain more would get into the Tetris um, piano sweepstakes. Really awesome pianos. We thought everybody would love them. The videos didn't quite blow, they did fairly well, but they didn't quite blow up, and so the, the campaign went really slow in the beginning. Um, and John from Indiegogo, I don't know if John's here. John is not here. John is John's not here. Awesome. Okay, so, so let me say, this, this guy John at Indiegogo kept emailing me before the campaign started. He's like, I'm looking over your campaign. I think it's great, but you need more 3D perks. And I kept rolling my eyes, being like, 3D perks, that's like the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. I don't know what that means. That's just like, this guy's just trying to sell me his book. I, I kid you not, I'm just like, this jerk is trying to sell me his book. <laughs> and um, I promise you, John, I, wherever you are, I, I don't think you're a jerk. Um, but I didn't really understand what that meant. I thought people would like the videos. I thought they'd want to be involved. And we were really slow to begin with. A lot of people said, oh, you have to get 30% in the first couple days or you're not going to make it. I think we're at like 5% a week and a half, two weeks in, and I was starting to really, really get worried. Um, so what we ended up doing is we, you know, we have these super high quality videos and we ended up just doing, okay, well, we need to do some sort of update video in addition to our big high quality videos. So we ended up just putting a camera on a tripod you know, with one light on top of the camera, the worst looking thing I've ever done in my life. Uh, we had, you know, this crappy mic that sounds terrible. And we just did Sony and I talking to the camera and then one of our Indiegogo contributors had actually sent us an email and said, ooh, I'd really love for you guys to do some Nintendo themes. And we're like, okay, well, we're not gonna do like a video based off of any of these Nintendo themes because it just, it takes forever and a lot of money for us to make our, our big videos. So we just did us in a piano and be like, okay, Sonia, who had never heard these Nintendo themes before, I think she had, we did seven, she had never heard six of the seven. 
And we're like, she would hear it, you know, she's a professional musician, so she's really talented. She would hear it for, you know, a couple seconds. She would turn around and she would just make something up, top of her head. Um, so we shot that video, we launched that, and I laughed when we, we, were, we were editing it, and I was like, this is the dumbest thing we've ever done. Watch this become our most popular video. Uh, we launched it, the thing did okay, and then a week later, Reddit picked it up, Kotaku picked it up, all these places started picking it up. The thing got like 400,000 views, and I was like, uh. And then everybody started you know, getting into the campaign, and I immediately was like, okay, we're gonna do more of those. So we did Disney themes on the spot, we did uh, uh, video game things on the spot, and w what happened was, um, as far as our perks are concerned, I had a conversation with Rebecca um, on the phone, and I was really at that point stressed out and being like, we're not gonna really make it, I, I'm worried about it. And she's like, you gotta stop thinking about it like, um, you have to stop thinking of it like you're, you're, you're going for your goal. You need to start thinking of it like it's a game. You need to get through level one, you need to get through level two. So uh, what we did was we, everyone loved this Nintendo themes on the spot thing, so we said, okay, well, we put a video out that said, help us reach 75% of our goal, and everybody who contributes, whatever amount you contribute, like $10, I think it was, will get a Nintendo album that we will professionally produce this album. Sony will take the time and do something awesome, and we'll do that. And that changed our whole campaign. Um, and I understood what John meant by 3D perks, and what he meant was you need to get people involved, you need to get people feeling like they're they want to help you get there. So instead of just being like, you do this and you get something great, it's like, help us get here. And then you got people being like, I really want you to make it, I really want that Nintendo album, I really want to do this. Um, we started doing that, and then we started doing these Facebook on the spots um, where we would be like, okay, well, for a certain amount of money, you know, you give us any song you want and we'll do a mini on the spot just for you and we'll actually thank you in the video and start doing that. And that, I'm still to this day, literally today, in the other room over there, I'm editing silly on the spot videos <laughs> to fulfill all these perks because we had so many people donating. Um, and that changed us. We, we, our whole campaign would not have existed without those. So 3D perks means just people feeling like they're involved, helping you, wanting to help you, um, and that, that was the trick. Awesome. Jimmy, what about you? What's your favorite perk? You have to think about it? Well, they're, I mean, they're all my favorites, right? <laughs> uh, so we ended up uh, giving away in a raffle a uh, car and jet ski, and those were chanced upon How did by, you get the car and the jet ski in the uh, first place? Uh, so two marches ago, or I guess it was, yeah, uh, last, yeah, sorry, last March, Almost a year to the date now, I, um, my friend uh, Adam, who was also working on the show with me, uh, moved to LA and he always wanted to go on, you know, like he wanted to go to see Jay Leno and Jimmy Kimmel and one of the things he wanted to do was go on The Price is Right. So uh, we were in a band together in college and we went with another bandmate and my girlfriend and we um, very excitedly got on stage. Uh, I was the second name called up and um, it felt very, I don't know, serendipitous, I guess, because the, the, you know how you bid before you're allowed to go on stage, and one of them was like, two point-and-shoot cameras that people use for, like, um, vlogging. I'm like, oh my gosh, I've seen a thousand of these things before. Uh, so I guess, like, the, the price of the two cameras on the dot, I went up, I snuck my way into the showcase showdown, and I also snuck my way into winning the prices right, because the guy overbid by 500 bucks. And I underbid by like 7,000, so I had no right to win any of this stuff, but I did. And the first thing I said to everyone as soon as the, it was all over was like, we have to give this all away because this is a great way. I don't, A, I have a car and I hate driving in LA, so I don't want another car, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> but also I really wanted to just, I felt like these prizes and the whole story behind it was a really fun way to just kickstart a campaign. Oh, sorry, bad word, bad word, bad word. <laughs> to uh, to <laughs> make a campaign go, go, go. Uh, we're gonna trademark that. Go, there go, go, go. Well, we had also, though, a lot of comments with the raffle for the jet ski and the car were like, well, why aren't you just, why aren't you just... Raffle. We were told raffle. Oh, sweepstakes. Oh, whatever. I was told. I was, told, sweepstakes. Sweepstakes. I was yeah. told by the lawyers never refer to it as a raffle. It's a sweepstakes. Oh, it's a sweepstakes? Yeah. <laughs> well, we oh, okay. sweep the stakes away yeah. by, okay, sweepstakes. A lot of the comments were, well, why aren't you just like selling that yeah. to, and, and use the money for that? And our big thing was, if you watch, and you can watch it, it's in the it's mm -hmm. in the Indiegogo video, Jimmy's face when he wins it, we're like, we want to give that 
to someone else. Yeah. And that's why we... That's our 3D perk. It's like, sure, we could sell it. Potentially, the gains that we get from just selling the stuff off and having a, like, a lump sum of money might be more than you could potentially fundraise, but then... You know, aren't you just sort of destroying the heart of a campaign if you do that? Like, where, where are you going to get your, like, oomph from? And we had to find that somewhere because, you know, on top of just having, like, name recognition from VGHS, I didn't think that was ever going to be enough because it's a tough world. There are a lot of, of campaigns out there, and there's a lot of criticism about campaigns, too, just because, I mean, the question at the end of the day is, like, do you really deserve more money? Like, shouldn't you be fine with what you have? And, like... I just wanted to avoid as much of that as possible and be open and clear about what we were doing. And in this case, it was, look, I won something, but I don't want it. I want to give it to someone else because someone else out there could use it way more than me. And if it's part of something that I'm passionate about and it can help fuel the project, you know, that would be my 3D perk or whatever. Yeah. I think you brought up something a second ago that I kind of want to revisit, which is um, there are a lot of campaigns out there. And I think that's you know kind of like YouTube. There's a lot of videos out there. So even if you have an audience, when you put up a YouTube video or when you launch a crowdfunding campaign, there's no, you can't just put it up, right? You can't build it and they will come. What did you guys all do to kind of keep the audience invigorated, keep them coming back, keep traffic coming to your campaign and keep not only the traffic but the contributions coming in? I mean, a big thing, a big learning point for us, even like definitely in our first campaign, definitely in our second campaign, and I think I think we finally learned it by our third campaign is to be active during the whole thing, which kind of sucks. It would be a lot easier if you could just put up the campaign and money would come in consistently, but it it, it was a matter of adding perks as you're going and, and, and also scheduling that and planning that out. Like, like one of the things for us, we knew that our season was gonna launch on January 6th. So we said, all right, uh, two weeks before the campaign closes, let's release a $5 perk that you get the premiere episode on Christmas morning. And, and so now that's, A, that's an excuse for everybody to come back to your page and look at it again. And you're constantly providing updates, and those updates go as emails to everybody, and it reminds it, it reminds them, oh, hey, this campaign is still going. Let me check in, or maybe let me go watch a video or two. And, and it, it allows people to continue to be active on the campaign even after they've donated. Yeah, and another thing that we did was, you know, our fans are really, um, they, you know, obviously they're all about the show. So we made the campaign as it progressed uh, it, the campaign would direct the show. So once we hit our goal, um, all of our, um, what's it called? A uh, Stretch goals? There you go. Yeah. Stretch goals. Because we, we hit our goal this last season with about, I think, like two, uh, two weeks left. Yeah, so all of our stretch goals manipulated what the show would be. We're like, all right, we hit our goal. The show, the season's going to be great. It's going to happen. However, we have this storyline that would be amazing, and here's some graphics of what it might look like, and if we made an extra five grand, we'd be able to do that. And so the fans are like, oh, we got to get that. And then when we hit that goal, it'd be like, and this character could have a music video. We'd love to do that. And, the, and so then they start really specifically seeing, oh, we're, we have to raise the money to get that music video, guys. Yeah, and, and, and it was also a thing of, it, we made it very clear, look, if we go above our goal, we're not putting that money in our pockets. We're going to put it back into the show. Right. We have an idea to do an, ac to do an action movie parody for an episode, but it would cost $5,000 more than the budget that we have for the season. So if, if we can raise that, we'll do it. Melissa, what about you? Because you raised, I think, what, three times your original goal amount. Yeah, um, I well, I was I was like too modest with my original. I think it was one of those things like Jimmy was saying. It's just or you just don't know how much you're gonna get. You don't want to feel like you deserve all the money, you know. Um, I originally got a grant for five thousand um, dollars from this place called the Creative District, and that kind of was like the impetus to be like, okay, I need more than five thousand to make the, the second season, but now I have to make it, so I'm gonna do it. Um, so I only raised, I asked for five and I ended up with 15 and I think, you know, it was a couple of things. I didn't have as many cool strategies as you guys did, but I, for me, it was knowing the platform that I had already, which was YouTube and the fans there, it had been a year since I had made the first season and they 
were asking about it and you know really wanting to see more so i re-engaged them and like would re reply to all of the old comments and be like here's the here it is if you want to kick in a few bucks and then i think it's just actively engaging with everyone that's contributing and it would took a lot of work but it's just you know replying to the comments any kind of tweets or new comments on youtube i just made sure that everyone felt a part of it and I think, and then when I did reach my goal, I broke down exactly what I would do with the money because, again, I wanted to make it clear that every dollar would go into could go into the show. And I ended up making a seventh episode. It was going to do six, or no, I was going to do five, and I did seven. And so I promised that as one of my stretch goals. But then I also just promised that this would be the best production that it could be. And so we ended up getting, you know, a steady cam to do these really interesting shots and making it a lot more cinematic. And I think that, you know, even though they didn't get much more, a lot of people are asking where to donate for the next season. So I think that they ultimately, like, people were happy with where all the money went. Did you run the campaign by yourself or did you have a team helping you or...? Ran it by myself. <laughs> Spent a lot of time over Christmas photoshopping until I almost died. Uh, but but it was it was tough. I would definitely recommend having a team and not doing what I did because it was it was a bleak time. Um, anybody that is thinking about starting a crowdfunding campaign, be prepared because it is a full time job. Um, it. I never ever, and I will again one day in probably 2016, but I never wanted to say Indiegogo again at the end of this campaign because I had said so many times, it, you almost feel, you have to get over the idea that you're constantly hitting people up for money in a certain sense. And that's why making it feel like you're, it's more than just asking them for money, making them feel like they're part of the process is so important. Um, especially because you know and when you first start, you'll get the trolls that come out of nowhere and they'll be like, you don't need any money. You've got an ad playing in front of your video, so clearly you're making thousands upon thousands of dollars. And it's like, um, you do not quite understand economics <laughs> of, of online video at the moment. Um, but for us, luckily, you know, we, for better or worse, because I had borrowed all that money to start our, um, to start our channel with and make all those videos, we had, con the whole plan was to have content throughout. And the idea was, you know, we'll be releasing something at least once every week, a high quality video, and something's going to hit. And then hopefully, like you were saying, even just about subscribers and getting things, um, hopefully something hits and then hopefully that will sort of, you know, launch the, the thing. And like I said earlier, it didn't hit for us for a while and it ended up being the complete, the video that we did not expect to hit, um, something that we didn't even plan on making, we just sort of made, um, that, that did it for us. Um, and then everybody started checking out the other videos and understanding what it was. But um, having a constant stream of videos uh, is extremely important. If, you, if we had just done one video, like, and that, a lot of people said, they were like, oh, you have great content, make a video, and then started, we never would have, nothing would have ever happened. One thing, just along with that, it just constant stream just sounds really intimidating. And I feel like the, the most important thing, a lot, bouncing off of that, is consistency. So even if you can only do two videos a month, it's like every other Thursday you're releasing a video. What really helped build subscribers on my channel was I it was the season was every Wednesday there would be a new video because, you know. It's easy to remember. <laughs> it's easy to remember. And I think that really makes people feel devoted and knowing when to come back is, yeah. I think, a really big deal. Yeah. Uh, to tag on that, actually, with streaming, we actually went to live streaming for a lot of, um, for about probably the last three weeks of the campaign. Mm -hmm. We did every weekend and you did a couple evenings because it was one thing that we did the, the basic we're doing Facebook on, on Jimmy's page and Twitter and doing the updates, but having that immediate response of people in the chat room on Twitch asking questions about the campaign and also having that fan engagement while they're watching, they'll actually <laughs> remind people in the chat room about the campaign itself. Yeah. So that was huge for us and it really helped just get everyone, not only Jimmy in front of the camera, but people involved in the project as well.
Yeah, and doing live streaming was really nice just because you could watch momentum build, especially in the last few days. It's like, guys, oh my gosh, someone just donated $150, and they had everyone that's going to be in the band or whatever, like, play a little jingle. Like, everyone was excited and stoked, and you could watch sort of, like, you can you can create your own momentum if you're able to live stream because people can tune in and watch stuff happen. And uh, I had someone that wanted to come in for $5,000, and I told, like, hey, if you're going to come at this level, email me beforehand. And this was towards the end. And I said, look, how about instead of just putting in the flat 5000 we do something on the final day, which is, like, for every dollar that someone else donates, you'll match it. And I learned that from listening to NPR and <laughs> endless <laughs> amounts of the farmers as they do. And it really helped out a lot because you could, you know, it's just, it's just really nice to have someone feel like when they donate, they're actually donating twice the amount. And being able to just make people excited and happy to do what they're doing and giving just even the smallest amount went a huge distance, especially in those last few days. And then they can see your reaction in real time too because we're seeing like refreshing constantly mm -hmm. to see where the goal is and they can see right away like, oh my gosh, this means so much to the, to the team, to the Band-Aid team. So. Yeah. I think those are those 3D perks. Yeah. Absolutely. So <laughs> yeah. I have one last question and then we're gonna open it up for Q&A. Um, if you guys could fund any Indiegogo campaign, what would it be like? What are you the ultimate fan of? What would you want to help make happen? You guys don't have to go in line. Thank you. <laughs> um, I always look at the design section. Like I really like really neat little things, like little devices to put on my desk to make my life a little easier, cool little gadgets and stuff. So I'm I'm like addicted to that because I think that that is such an amazing. It's a thing that people are really coming up with that's, uh, that they can do on their own. Like they design this great little device and they just need money to mass produce it. And it's like, I think that's really opening up a lot of amazing. So anyway, I just love looking at those little things. Well, I really like the campaign we were talking about in the green room, oh, which yeah. was yeah. <laughs> um, those pants right there, having a campaign for those pants to travel around the world. Yeah. Uh, where every, uh, it would just, the, it was be the sisterhood yeah. of the traveling single pair of pants. Single pair. These have yeah, been yeah. in Tokyo and Hong Kong. Yeah, yeah, Does that count? S yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. Done. One, um, one man wears those pants every day for the rest of his life. Yeah, yeah, that's what How it is. much would you give to that campaign? Yeah, any kind of dare, a, a dare campaign. A dare campaign. No matter how much really they deteriorate, you can't take them off or switch them out. No. Oh, and the perk is a day calendar of every picture of every day. He has to wear those. Like, yeah. that's, that's it. I mean, but in the serious note, I, I'm just such a huge fan of film and, t and, and series. And I think, you know, anything that I can see on Indiegogo where there's a real proof of concept and a real point of view that hits me, I want to donate because I think that's what kind of the arts is changing and it feels like more of a collaborative environment where you are a part or not, the audience is a part of the art and I think that's a really exciting place you're to be. You're not just a pair of eyes anymore. Yeah, yeah, you're engaged, you're, you're a part of the conversation and I think that's really exciting. Um, I have one silly one and one real one. We were listening to this podcast from these New Zealanders, and actually Brittany has someone that's similar that's done something similar, but they, uh, the podcast was once a week they would watch Grown Ups 2 with Adam Sandler and then podcast about it, and they'd do that for a full year. So they'd had to watch the movie 50-some-odd times, and <laughs> I feel like they deserve money just for doing that. Um, my serious note would be, I'd love to see a documentary that really just goes in depth on how much it actually costs to make stuff in Hollywood. You know, everyone sees the budgets come up and they're like, oh, what? That's way too much money. How could they spend that much money? It's like, you don't even understand how fast you watch money literally fly from your pockets when you're making something and you've hired on 30 people. I think it'd be a really fascinating documentary to go in and look at like big budget movies, medium budget movies, small budget movies, and how the percentages differ, but ultimately that it's not a cheap endeavor and how much of a headache and how crazy it can be so that people have, have more of a at least realistic look at these kind of campaigns when they go up. Yeah, somehow people think it's like magic and things just happen. You know, well, it oh, is like, movie magic. It is movie magic, but hell, going you know, up to it. People are like, "Oh, you're clearly only spending like five hundred dollars to make this." It's like <laughs> I spent like ten thousand dollars to make this. Yeah, we get a lot of people going. You're just moving dolls. How much money do you need? <laughs> it's like, yeah, we're doing it for eighty hours a week, bro. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, yeah. Um, I well, I would have said that I would I would have totally funded any GoGo campaign for another season of Twin Peaks, but. That's clearly going to happen. Taken care of. That's taken care of. So um, I'm a big sucker for feel-good campaigns. 
Um, I like anything that, that just, you know, gives me the feels. So, you know, I, I think I saw one the other day that I donated to, um, not I think, I saw one the other day that I donated to that was all about um, helping uh, children in, in developed country, in underdeveloped countries um, learn music. And being a music channel, that was one we wanted to support. Um, but like stuff like that, I just think is great causes are, are really, really just special, so. Awesome. Speaking of great causes, I, f I finally figured out mine. If I could donate to one Indiegogo campaign, I put together a full house reunion. <laughs> Straight up. Get the Olsen twins in there. Uh, Jody Sweeten, Candace Cameron, all the guys. We can even bring the little mop-haired twins, all of them. Nice. Awesome, I like that. Yeah, yeah. All right, cool. Really well, important you. cause there. Way to follow the... Uh... <laughs> That's hey, the bit, Mark. If it's making That's someone the bit feel that good, I was doing. Then it's all right. Is I don't it... think I can beat that. <laughs> as long as they teach them all how to play music, I'll be fine. Yeah. yeah go. well, we, we've got Jesse and the Rippers, of course. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, guys. Uh, I want to open it up to a Q&A if anybody in the audience has questions. Yes. So the question was, how do you market outside of your audience when you're running your Indiegogo right. campaign? Well, uh, we didn't have a core fan base when we started, really. So um, we had to market pretty much everything. What I found really good um, at first was, you know, there's a couple services out there that will, you, you set up like this sort of email, this sort of stock message, and it will message every single person in your Facebook feed. So all your friends and family, that's your first place you have to start. Um, and it sucks having to reach out to people and basically just ask them for money, but you have to word it in such a way that doesn't make it just seem like, oh, I'm trying to do this. You, you need to be more like, hey, this is this new thing that I'm starting, it's awesome, check it out, and then hopefully they go from there and, and, and try to do something. So that was a big thing. The other thing for us, you know, like I said, our whole plan to begin with was new videos every week, and then hopefully one of those videos would, would gain some traction and go somewhere, and that's how we marketed the whole thing. That's how we built everything. Um, but as far as like, we didn't do any spends as far as like advertising or, or hiring a publicist. You know, I, I looked into that a little bit, but we didn't have any money. I think organic works better anyway. I mean, if you, yeah. people come to your campaign because they care about it, they're more likely to contribute or share it with their friends. Exactly, and I, I was gonna say the other thing is have really cool perks that people who might not be huge fans of yours right now would look at me like, oh, well, that's cool. Oh, I, I, I would get that. I, I would get that coffee mug. I would get that shirt just because it's well designed and it's well made and it's something that I would enjoy having. And the other thing is, you know, our show is very narrative based and, and we, you know, we, we don't really follow pop culture as far as like try to do little spoofs of things that are currently going on, but during the Indiegogo campaign, because we were making a video a week just exactly at that time that would not be useful any other time, we did do some more kind of contemporary jokes or things that were going on in the news or any sort of like big pop culture thing. We'd make a video about that one campaign. We did a trailer for the season where each character spoofed a trailer of all the big movies going on right now. So those are kind of things that are kind of current that are going on that can get spread beyond just our show, but at the end it's really tying back to this show that we're doing in the next big season. Yeah, to kind of uh, write on that note, we were thinking about what is shareable and what would get someone that maybe doesn't know Video Game High School or Jimmy involved um, with the How project. How about a brand new car? <laughs> yeah, so the car, the car helps and people know the price is right. Um, but also with our campaign video, we made it a musical. But it's not just musical, it's very um, tongue in cheek about, hey, we need your money <laughs> to make this thing happen. Because we thought that that's something that it's not just us in front of the camera being, hey, we need your money to make this thing that's a musical. It's a proof of concept, and it's also, um, it's playful. It's lighthearted. It's fun. So that was kind of like, that's your first impression is mainly going to be that video when they come to your page. So that was really where we wanted to get the most eyes. Yeah. Um, also, I'd say the, the internet is a big, vast world of stuff and uh, blogs and related, you know, vlogs and blogs and all that stuff. They are always looking for content to publish. And if you create a campaign with the idea in mind that this needs to be different from the rest, this needs to have something about it that is unique and inherently shareable, 
um, every, come every single Monday, every person that submits stuff to blogs that they work for or write for is looking for content. And if you have that content for them, every single one of those websites has a submit a link here. And it might take you a while to find all of them, but the, the internet is a big wide place and everyone has their own following, however big and large. So just reaching out to anyone that you can and submitting your stuff on like Sunday nights when people are looking for content to post is always helpful. Yeah, I was going to tag along to that just to say, yeah, I think niche audiences, figuring out what your niche audience is, really, like, what is your idea and why would someone who doesn't know you care about it and want to share it? And if you have that answer and you know that it's, like, this pocket of people, like, my first wave of press for Wednesday Adams, the first season was from like a, a few gothic tumblers. And it was just because I had looked at a lot of those kinds of places and just submitted it everywhere. But those are the ones that picked it up first because it's an, a niche audience who loves it. And so I think that's finding that audience and let it, letting that be the seed to have it grow out of is really great. Oh, and, and I just want to also say, and I apologize to the publicists of the world, but um, when I used to work for a, a larger web channel, they had publicists that they would hire and do stuff. And I always found that we would get a lot more traction when I would just personally email every single blog that had anything to do with the content that I wanted to do, that, that I had for the video. Um, and then they'd start getting picked up. But when I would just relied on like a publicist to do something for me, we never got anything. But when we did get stuff from emailing people, the publicist, you, you better believe, would email and be like, great, we got picked up here and here and here. And you're like, uh, yeah, all right. And Sounds like you just have a bad publicist, <laughs> No, I mean, no, 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 no. I'm sure we have, there are great publicists in the world. We clearly did not have a good I'm one. a publicist, guys. And, <laughs> and just one other thing was, you know, it's also good to kind of deputize big backers or like big people who are really supportive of you, even if they don't have that much money, if they're really energetic, then say, hey, the more word you spread, the more we appreciate it. You know, we had a, a fan of the show who was a doctor and he had a jar in his hospital and he would make all the nurses put money in the jar and he was like, we're going to get this big perk. And they raised a bunch of money. Just one guy who raised a bunch of money for us. And we were really, we engaged with that guy a lot and talked to him a lot. And so if you see people who are really energetic and they're talking to you about the campaign, talk to them because that's always good. So I think uh, the pizza's here. Uh, um, I mean, one last question. Yep. Thank you. Um, how much, couple questions. How much time ahead do you plan? For your campaign to launch, and also when you talk about transparency, you're obviously getting some pay. So is that just wrapped in your production cost? So you don't like break it down to the audience, in other words. Well, what we, what we did personally was, especially this season, we've gotten so big. It's like we're not going to hide the fact that we make money off of ad revenue. So in the campaign, not only did we talk about, we said, here's the budget for the show. And here's the section we're trying to raise from you guys. We're going to pay. We were actually, I, mean, I think we tried to raise 15000 yeah. and we, we were going to pay 20000 out of pocket. And we'd show them. We'd say, here's the whole budget. You're going to pay for this section. We're going to handle all this. And we think that really helped because they were like, look, they're asking for what they can't pay for. They're putting in a bunch. So it's not like they're just like, hey, give us money. And we're going to pretend we don't actually make money. So I think that really, because we ended up raising over 25000 Yeah. At the end of the day. A, a huge thing in terms of transparency is put an FAQ at the bottom of your campaign mm -hmm. where, and, and, and you, can you can constantly update it of questions that you're getting of like, don't you guys make money off of YouTube ads? Yeah, we make money off of YouTube ads, but it's not enough to fund an entire season up front. And, 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 you, and you can explain all, all, everything that goes in like that. And the more transparency, the better. And just quickly about uh, the timeline, how far in advance did you start planning your campaign, Melissa? Um, I pl planned it, I guess, in terms of, I'm not sure if it's backwards or forwards, but um, I got my grant in September and then started planning the campaign and launched it like the week of Halloween because it was Wednesday Adams. And, but before I did that, I made sure that I had all of my ducks in a row for production because I feel like starting as soon as you can after the campaign ends just keeps the momentum going and also shows the audience that you're really devoted to it. I think if you have a big lapse in between, it can bum people out and wonder if you just went you know, to Fiji. 
So I think it's I think it's good to like have everything sorted out and like I had my dates locked with my director and and my producer and all of that before I even started the campaign. How was Fiji, by the way? Was that it was like, fantastic yeah, this time of year. I like their water. I hear it's great. Oh yeah. <laughs> we started planning Band Aid back in April when Jimmy and I first met mm-hmm. on Video Game High School. I wish we'd started earlier, honestly. Yeah, but um, we we wanted it to be completely separate from Video Game High School, so we actually waited till October. Um, yeah. It didn't take that long to plan because um, we're both familiar with campaigns. This wasn't our first campaign that we had done, but there's just, just so much more that happens in yeah. the middle, and like you know, Tom was saying, like they released one video in the middle that happened to just really like give it a gut punch and have it get going. Um, I just feel like you know you should plan far enough in advance that you have content to release, and you know exactly when you want to release that, what key points during the campaign. You know that there's going to be a, a surge in the middle, beginning and end. You know, have stuff that's all tailored around that. Just try to not leave it up to as last minute as possible because you're going to be worried about so many other things going into the campaign and so many new things are going to be flying at you. Take your time playing it out. And unless you have a strict start date, you know, really just make sure that you have all your ducks in a row. Yeah, however much time you think you're going to need, give yourself about three times the amount. Um, we had a lot of, you know, I, I started really locking in some of the money that I borrowed from friends in August, started making videos in September and October. Uh, we didn't release any of them. And then we started releasing uh, at the very end of October and started the, the Indiegogo at like the beginning of November. Um, and I, we put a lot of thought and time into the production. I wish we had, had been able to put more thought and time into the Indiegogo. Thankfully, it worked out really well. <laughs> Um, but it was stressful as, as heck, and I'll, I'll tell you that the next time I do it, I will put a lot more time into the planning of it. Well, you guys all ran amazing campaigns. I want to thank you guys for taking part in the panel. Uh, you guys are all awesome.